Yes, hello everybody and welcome to Real Reds Talk. Hope you're all doing good. The title of the show today is Good Luck, Ten Hag. And I'm basically going to have an in-depth look at the Everton game, our team in general. Um, and yeah, get into a few stats because I, I believe it's important for people to know where we're going wrong specifically. And I've also got some topical stuff to get into as well. Um, some breaking news that we've had coming from David Ornstein out of The Athletic. Um, that he's saying basically the highly rated Darwin Nunes is a target for Manchester United, PSG and Chelsea in the upcoming transfer window. Um, now, I think everybody knows my thoughts on Darwin Nunes uh, as a player. I think he's a phenomenal talent. I brought his stats up on the show last week, but I'm going to do it again just because they are that eye-catching. Um, I want everybody to know what this boy is about. Um, so, yeah, he's got 24 goals in 24 games for Benfica, um, recently scored a hat-trick. A lot of people will say, well, will that translate to the Premier League? If you think about the likes of Bruno Fernandes, who obviously signed for us two years ago um, and put in really good numbers, you know, one of the best in the Premier League in regards to that. And Luis Diaz of late, who signed for Liverpool, is absolutely killing it um, for them. So it can, it just depends, it can translate, it just depends on certain players and how they adapt and stuff like that. So I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen. I'm just saying, judging off recent history, then it's, you know, why not? Why not? Um, he's got five goals in five starts in the Champions League, which is incredible. Uh, scored run against the Scousers as well. So fair play for that. Um, he's six foot two, clocked to top speed quicker than Mbappe, Walker, Sadio Mane and Salah in the Champions League. Uh, I think it was, I believe it was 36.5 kilometres an hour or something like that. And for his height for six foot two, that is, um, yeah, quick. But he's 22 years old. He'll be 23 in June. Um, a great technical dribbler and he can finish his dinner. Like, he's solid on both feet as well. Um, the only thing is with him, he's got a bit of a, a bit of a mad touch at times and his decision making is a bit rough. But again, as a young player, he, he can be moulded, you know, he can be worked with. He's, um, he's certainly promising anyway. So, yeah, I think he's being priced around 80 million euros, but a lot of credible people saying we could get him for maybe 60 um, with add-ons as well, which in today's market is probably standard if you think about it. Um, for someone of that quality. But the thing that worries me is that he mentioned, obviously David Ornstein mentions in the article itself that PSG and Chelsea um, will also be in for him as well. So if you think you think about the prospects to play for PSG in a minute, right? So we'll take them three teams and we'll look at, if you're a player, why? What's the reason you would go to them? Okay, so PSG, you get the chance to play with Neymar and Messi, two of the best players the, world, the world's ever seen, obviously more so Messi. But you also get a chance to replace Kylian Mbappe and be one of that main figureheads in, in the front three. You're guaranteed to win trophies. Now, obviously, it's not going to be the Champions League because PSG um, consistently flopping that but they're going to league, win a league cup and the most likely going to win the league aren't they let's be serious so it's almost guaranteed trophies a chance to live in the beautiful city Paris as well um, so that's why I would put PSG top for me I would put them at the top as an attractive prospect out of them three teams um, and I'll say the reason why Chelsea is second. Um, so Chelsea have had the issues this season, um, no doubt mainly because of the owner and all stuff that's going on there. But they're still European champions. They have a lot of quality and quality depth, um, plus a world-class coach in Thomas Tuchel. So that's still an attractive prospect for a young player looking to go there. And it's in the Premier League as well. So, yeah, another great option. Um, but the only reason why I place him second to get Darwin Nunes is because of big Rob. It depends what happens with Lukaku now. You've obviously seen things this season where he's come out of an interview saying he still loves Inter Milan, he loves Italy, how he was treated there. Everything was different. It's not necessarily going great with Chelsea, all that kind of stuff. And then he ultimately came out and then apologised for it, didn't he, pretty much. But I just think it depends what happens with him. If they can recoup some of that, what did they pay, that like £100 million, pounds, something like that for him? If they can recoup some of that, um, then they might be in with a shout, but it all depends about the market. I can't see Inter going back in for him like a year later and paying the same price that they paid for him. So they'll probably want like, because he's in another year into his career, they'll probably want him back for the same price they bought him for, like 70, 80 million. And I don't know if Chelsea will do that or not. And I don't even know if they can sell or buy players depending on whether the club gets bought. So that's another big thing that's kind of hindering on it. It all depends on that. No clarity, really. Speaking of no clarity, um, you then look at the mess that we are, um, Manchester United. We, we have a big pull because of the name, but really at the moment, that's that's it. Because you think about it next season, we won't be in the Champions League. 
We've dragged players down to a shit level when we signed him. The manager still hasn't been sorted yet. We're still waiting for that to be announced. There's potential for about 10 different players to be to leave or to be sold. Um, and if you're going to make a big move like that, if you're a young player, you need stability and certainty for both sides. And I just I don't see that with United at the minute. It doesn't look like a stable foundation to go in and grow as a player. Like I said, we tend to drag players down at the minute when we sign them. So depending on how much of a clear out we're going to have and how much of a role Ronaldo's going to have next season, that's 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 what it's all depending on. We're still everybody's waiting to find out like what the fuck's the plan, what's going on. Um, it's typical, isn't it? United is just slow at everything. So I think they need to get other priorities in order first before they start signing targets. I know you start to speak to players months before the season ends, but how can you speak to players if you don't even know who the manager is yet? Now, I get it. It's leaning towards Ten Hag. We're all saying, you know, it's going to be announced soon. It's going to be announced soon. But United can still fuck things up. They've done it before. Notorious for it. So, yeah. Um, look, if, if we did manage to sign him somehow, he would be first on my list for a young, promising striker around Europe. He really would. Um, I think he's that good. And to learn off Ronaldo, because obviously Ronaldo's in the decline. We know that. And he can't play every game. It'd be nice to tail them both together and have him learn from Ronaldo. Um, it'd be interesting to see, but I'm not I'm not going to hold my breath on that one because I just, yeah, I, I, I believe it when I see it. It's one of them, like, my everyone has, like, dream signings, don't they, of certain people who they want. Like, I'd want a Chumina, Nunes, uh, centre-back. Who would I want for a centre-back? Let me think. Dream sign, Marquinhos, something like that. I rate Marquinhos. Someone like that. Um, in the summer window would be amazing, but it never, ever ends up like that. Never. It's always, you get one player who you probably wanted and then the rest are kind of, yeah, other signings they want to get. So, yeah, like I said, I'm not going to hold my breath on it. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see what happens with that. So let's dive into the main part of the show. I just want to say thank you to the lads who went live and did the post-match analysis for that depressing game. I imagine it must have been a struggle to analyse that crock of shit. So Shreya's... Adam, Dan and Sam, thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. Um, to be fair, it feels like a, a while since I've been on in front of this lovely camera, to be honest. So it's nice to be back. I had a great weekend in Belfast. Um, the people over there, very welcoming, very expensive, but they had nice bars and they had nice restaurants as well. So, yeah, me and my girlfriend really enjoyed it. Um, however, there was one thing that put me in a mood on Saturday, and you all know exactly what I'm going to say. It was Manchester United losing to Everton. Um, 1-0 and lost to probably the most out of form team in the league at the minute now I was watching this game in a sports bar in Belfast surrounded by Everton fans who were chucking beers about in celebration because they just beat us and rightfully so because that was a massive game for them massive game for them and you could see every player working to the instructions and grassing out for the team and grinding a result out and you would think it wasn't a massive game for us but in terms of top four which we have a very thin chance of getting anyway. That's just a nail in the coffin now, like, for top four, I believe. I know Arsenal lost, but if you look at Tottenham at the minute, they are absolutely flying under Conte. Um, and they look in really good form. So they're probably favourites now for top four, which is, you know, it's kind of turned on its head now, isn't it? Although they have still got Arsenal to play in that North London derby, which is going to be massive. So, yeah, again, yet to see that. We'll, we'll see what happens with it. So, yeah, United... On the other hand, in that game, we're complete opposite. We have, you know, individual players that are great and extremely talented, but as a functioning team with chemistry, we are near the bottom of the table, 100%. 100%. We are so bad as a team. Like, there's no cohesiveness at all. Nothing. No no green links, whatever you want to call it. It just, just looks like a bunch of individuals, doesn't it? Um, and I want to pull up a few things to highlight this. So I've, I've threw in a few... Fun facts, all that kind of stuff. So in that game, Everton ran 10k more than what we did as a team. Desire, blood, sweat, tears, comes back to all that again. Um, we had seven shots inside the box and couldn't convert one. Poor finishing. They won 55% of ground duels um, and we won 45% of ours. Lack of desire and quality. Our only threat was the left-hand side with Tellez and Sancho because we can't create enough through the middle. And the right side is non-existent, especially when Aaron Wan-Bissaka is playing because they're always chopping and changing it. Is it Wan-Bissaka and Ilango? Is it Dallow and Rashford? They are always changing that side, so there's never a constant link-up. If you look at Liverpool, they have Robertson, Mane, Trent, Salah, pretty much every single game. So they have that partnership that they can link up really well. We never have that. It's inconsistency in uh, team selection. 
all the time. Um, we dominated possession, but did fuck all with it. Like when you watch City, they, they work angles and they love repetitive behavior in order to create patterns for positional play. Um, we look like absolute strangers on the pitch. We just got together for a last minute, um, 11 aside, and was just like, Yeah, bring your mate, bring your mate, bring your mate, and we'll, we'll set up and go by it, go by here. Uh, that's how we play. It just looks like it's, it's random. And I don't think it's a coaching thing, I just think it's the players in general. I do. I'm not even going to blame Ragnick, and it's not because I like Ragnick. I just think the players, you've seen them under every manager. They've, they always do that. They have patches where they play really good. Like when Ralph first came in, do you remember that Crystal Palace game, the first half? I was so excited by that. I was I was like, oh, my God, we're going to end up challenging. For, if we can play like this, we're going to challenge you for titles. We're going to do this, we're going to do that. And within, you know, two games, they threw it out the window. We started playing Norwich and Newcastle and conceding like 12, 13 shots to teams that were like bottom of the table at the time. And I'm just sat there thinking like, how can you go put in such good performances like that and then just throw it all away? You'll have 10 games where you're just playing absolutely awful. I feel like they're playing for themselves and their own accolades. And if, if something's not going right for them, then that has a detrimental impact on the rest of the team then. And they drag everybody else down with him. Like Maguire, Maguire's the captain. He sets the standard. But he's dragging everyone down with him with the, the performances he's putting in and the mistakes he's making. Um, some more, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just get a drink. Try for ah, it's better. Yeah, so in that game, possession was lost 185 times. Bruno lost possession 21 times. Now, I know he's supposed to be the creative outlet, so naturally we'll have. Um, a lower percentage but if you watch that game he really does do unnecessary passes like he always tries that Hollywood ball when it's it's not even on a lot of the time and when you're trying to take control in a game things like that really kill the mood really kill the mood because you work so hard to, to create an opportunity and when he gets on the ball he's, he's giving it too much he's overdoing it if you like do you know what I mean it's like decision making basics City's team I hate I hate to keep comparing us to City don't get me wrong but City's team make the right decisions every single time. Every pass is crisp, spot on. And that's how it needs to be in the Premier League. You can't have, you know, play 15 long long passes, through balls, whatever you want to call it, and have one successful and you get an assist in the game. And then they'll get applauded for that. That's not how it should work. Um, he, needs to, he needs to filter out the badness and bring it more balanced. And I think a right coach to come in and do that with Bruno it'll become a much better player. And Rainian is petulance as well, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, so, yeah, Alex uh, Tellez as well lost possession 28 times, but I think you can bring crosses into that, and I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, then Sancho only lost possession six times, and I think we need more players like this to take care of the ball, basically, because, you know, in terms of, like I said, it comes back to control. When you're trying to control the game, you need players with smart football IQ, who can hold the ball technically really good and it keeps that momentum then you can keep having waves of attacks, waves of attacks. You see that with City, you see that with Liverpool, you see that with even Barcelona now under Xavi, the way they're playing. That's why teams hated playing against them. I remember, was it Jack Wilshire, I think on TalkSport, saying about Busquets was just impossible to get near. I know we had a good game against them, but he was saying that, that midfield three of Iniesta, Xavi, Busquets, they kept the ball so well and always made the right decisions. It was almost impossible to get the ball off him. And then when you did, it was that good defensively, solid, like you couldn't get through. So that is like, obviously United ain't going to play like that <laughs> at the minute, but that's what you need to strive for, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and stop giving away silly transitions and stupid goals, because that's where it all comes from. Um, that's where Matic's game uh, got. Um, sorry, that's where Everton's goal came from. Matic made a bad pass, he intercepted it, got on the transition. We're not quick enough to get back, not committed enough. They go and score and then ultimately win the game. So, another thing to look at. Uh, at the other end of the pitch, Ronaldo had one shot on goal in that game because he spent most of his time um, near Bruno while Matic trying to get involved. So, when we actually got a decent into a decent position, no one was in the box to take the chance. Like, countless crosses went in. And, yeah, no one at the end of it. Matic um, had seven out of seven long balls. His distribution from the middle of the part was good, but he hasn't got the legs. For, it goes back to what I was saying before. He hasn't got the legs for transition, and the goal came from his mistake. Alex Tellez had 13 crosses, two successful. 
um, because no one was in the box. 80.5% accurate pass percentage, won most of his ground and aerial duels and was our main threat in that game. So probably my man of the match personally um, and my left back of choice unless Luke Shaw can get his act together. Um, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, a player who I've seen on a few apps got a really good rating and I didn't think he was that good. I thought people were kind of over-egging it, but... Yeah, he, Juan Basaka won 11 out of 17 ground duels, which we know is a great defensive uh, wing back. We know this, but his accurate pass percentage was 59%, which is awful, absolutely awful. Um, if you look at Cancelo yesterday in that Liverpool game, or even Kyle Walker, they had 75 to, on average, 75 to 80% accurate pass, accurate passes, sorry. And they're creating a lot more than Juan Basaka, so naturally that should be lower. Um, so that is something he definitely needs to work at if he wants to be a full-time fullback for Manchester United going forward. Um, as I've said before, it reminds me of this is no disservice to Gary Neville or anyone like that because he was quality, consistent right backs, but it reminds me of like a 90s right back, like your job only is just to defend. Um, and the, the focus is a lot more on that. Whereas these days, a modern fullback, they're like the main players in the game. They become like the midfielders, especially the city's team with Cancelo and stuff like that. Um, he has been their most important player this season, um, Cancelo. So, yeah, if we have Juan Basako, if you flip that situation on its head and we have Juan Basako being our most important player, how far do you think we're going to get, really? That's what you need to ask yourself. Um, I also want to take a closer look at yellow cards because our discipline on the pitch is non-existent and there's no one pulling this team together demanding a certain standard like a Roy Keane used to do. No one on that pitch is pulling him saying, why are you doing that? Why It's either the moaning, a petulant, or like, you know, it just doesn't come across that he's a leader there. We really need a few leaders in that team. Um, and that falls back to the summer transfer window again. Like that's, We're going to have to get some big, like, big, big players in to change the squad because, and it's going to take time. Like Severe, Sam said it on the last show we did, it's going to take patience because... One transfer window ain't going to sort this mess out. Not a chance. Yeah, just sticking on yellow cards. Mick Tomney has nine yellows. Uh, Luke Shaw has eight. Bruno has seven. So that's three players automatically who are near the top um, for most yellow cards in the Prem. Maguire and Pogba have seven. And Ronaldo has six, which is joint top for most yellows in that league for a striker. Um, a lot of the yellow cards given to Luke Shaw, Pogba, McTominay and Maguire are where they get caught out of possession and try and make up for an error. I went back and watched them. Um, a lot of them are that. There's obviously a few different ones, but that's the main reason why they're getting it. Bruno, yellow cards, no surprise either. Moaning at the ref or reacting to how bad they're performing and lashing out. Ronaldo's is the same, either moaning about something or he's lost the ball and kicked out. Like, do you remember... I, I liked it in the Liverpool game. I didn't mind it when I think he kicked Trent or something like that. But that's just because we was getting battered and you want to see a bit of a reaction. But in reality, it's still petulance. It still falls into that category of petulance. So it is what it is. Um, but they all, it's just, you know what it is, right? They all remind me of like a class in school under a supply teacher when, you know, when it gets to summertime and they know there's only a few, uh, few weeks left until they break up for the summer um, and everybody's running riot because you can't, you know... You can't control the class. Everybody's just like fucking going wild, and the, the supply teacher don't know what to do. You can't, you can't suspend everyone. You know, it's because you've got a class of thirty people. So you're just like, what the fuck do I do? And this, and these issues may carry into next year. You might have to try and worm out the bad ones over a period of time to get everybody singing from the same hymn sheet. This is why I'm saying it's gonna, for me anyway, at least it's gonna take four, five years. To sort this out, I don't think it's what Rang it says. I don't think it's going to be, you know, two, three transfer windows. I think it's going to take a long, long time to get rid of some of these players that are here. Um, it's not realistic to get rid of 10, 12, and it's never happened. I don't think it's ever happened in world football where they've got rid of like half the squad and brought in another 12 because then they're going to have to gel. It's going to take a while for them to do that. And new managers got to get his feet under the desk, see the root of the problems, uh, implement a system all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to take a long, long time, in, in my opinion, anyway. Um, I, I genuinely believe that we should sell half of this squad. And I know it isn't realistic, but it just seems they're all playing for themselves. There's no togetherness. They're all selfish, egotistical twats. Like, it has to be said. It has to be said. Do I think they care? Yeah, slightly. Um, that's why sometimes they kick out and they're not... They, but oh, I don't know. Like they're not 
showing a hundred percent commitment in every game. I, I don't care what anyone says. You go back to the start before the Everton game. They ran Everton ran ten kilometers more than us on Saturday, and they had the cheek not even to clap the away fans on the way out. It was only Sancho, I think, who clapped the away fans. Like us fans are working class people who graft, yeah. Monday to Friday, travel up and down the country to see United play and pay a lot of money for tickets at times. Um, and they get that reception at the end. You know what I mean? Just one person clapping. When you've just lost to a relegation battle in Everton and put in an absolute stinker of a performance, like, that is just us in a nutshell at a minute. It's so toxic and so bad. Um, and the players need to take accountability. They need to take accountability instead of getting the fucking PR managers to do it and spinning shit and saying, you know, he's... He's, he's he's just they try to paint a positive picture on our shit situation and it's frustrating for, for United fans because it's the United fans who are suffering really watching that every week in week out we, and yeah look we have been blessed with glory over the past 20 30 years or whatever we have we've been super successful and every team has the kind of down period like Gary Neville was referring to it in the podcast that he did and um, the Gary Neville podcast and he said you look at them Liverpool fans over there, the away fans who were still in that section singing and stuff, who put in, you know, a great performance against City yesterday. They, uh, they both had a really good game. And he's saying Liverpool were at a point um, when Jurgen, before Jurgen Klopp came in, they was, you know, watching other people like us, Chelsea, City, um, City as well, being successful. And they had to put up with rival fans giving them shit and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. And we are going through that period now. This is the... T- unless it gets which it may do, unless it gets really worked, like, you know, we're going to the second half of the table. Um, it's it's going to be bad for a bit. It's going to be bad for a bit. And it's going to take time and patience. And I know I keep saying it, but it is. That's how it's going to be. And, yeah, we're just going to have to pull ourselves through it somehow. You know, we <laughs> after this season, you're going to think no one's got anything left in the tank because it's just so deflating. So deflating. Like I watched the, the 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 analysis that the lads did, and they just looked so depressed. They looked so depressed. Like, yeah, where do we go from here as United fans? But that's what it is. That's your team. You have to support them. You get up every day, and you know, try hope. <laughs> it sounds like I'm um, doing like a speech here, but you try hope just for, for something. Not every day, but like a performance on a weekend where, that you're proud of, you know what I mean? Where they go in 3-4-0 and you're like, right, that's United. Wing play, exciting, attacking play where you score a good few goals and you dominate a team and you're like, boom. But we haven't even... When was the last time we had a dominating performance and we looked comfortable? Someone please tell me. Drop it in the comments below. Let me know because I can't remember. I just remember nil nils, one ones, one nils. I, can't, I cannot remember. It's probably leads to something, if I'm guessing. But apart from that, I can't remember the last time. Um, yeah, I just I hope they give Ten Hag the keys to United and just let him get rid of players who, who won't work for the team. And if that's Maguire, Rashford, Pogba, Juan Bissaka, or even Ronaldo, so be it. I don't care. This is partially a legacy that Oli has made with these players, making them believe the better than what they are, become the best friend, install bad habits in them in terms of coaching. Um, it's a massive mess. It's a massive mess. We've got Marshall coming back from Sevilla on loan, where even, you know, the fans there are booing him. He's on 200k a week. When he comes back, are we going to sell him? Um, we're losing Paul Pogba on a free again when we pay £90 million to get him back in the first place, and that's never worked for, for any of us, I don't believe. Um, we should have sold Lingard in the summer to West Ham and got some money for him, but... He's played a few handful of games for us because Oli decided to keep him on. Oli's not here anymore. Lingard keeps being constantly disrespectful on social media. That's having a negative, like a grey cloud over the club. Players like Mata, Matic, Jones, Bailly should have been sold last year or a few years ago in some cases to free up space for young talent coming through. We signed Ronaldo, so City won't get him and we didn't have a system in place to complement him. We made Donny van der Beek our summer signing and hardly used him and loaned him out to Everton because he was unhappy with game time. Bruno Fernandes needs to be coached properly to rein it in, to rein in, sorry, some of his bad habits um, and his petulance. We signed Harry Maguire for £80 million and he's had one of the worst declines in English football. On top of that, he's club captain, so he's setting the standards with his shit performances and that's having a, a negative effect on the team. Varane is quality, but he's injured a lot, so we can never get consistency in the team with a centre-back partnership. 
If we're going to be honest, neither Dallo or Wan Bissaka are good enough at the moment to compete with Cancelo, Hakimi, Trent, Reese James, these type of players. Maybe Dallo can develop in time, but again, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Luke Shaw, like Maguire, has had a massive decline since the Euros and had incons- had a lot of inconsistent set. Um, Tellers has been better, I'd probably say, this season, but that's another one where you say, are any of them good enough, really, to be at the top, top level, winning Champions Leagues and stuff like that? Like, Ask yourself, have an honest conversation with yourself as a United fan. I think, can Luke Shaw or tell us really be at the highest level? Luke Shaw, maybe. We've seen it from him before, but consistency comes into that always. Um, yeah, David De Gea has been great for us this year, you know, with his shot-stopping ability. But if someone like Ten Hag comes in, I think he, he, he could be cutthroat like Pep was with Joe Hart when he came in. If they, if they don't have a keeper that suits their style of play, especially Ten Hag, how he likes to build up from the back, um, I I've always said De Gea's distribution isn't good enough, so that could be something he looks at and be like, I, I want a new keeper. That's another problem that you, that you got to throw on that. And then you got to think David De Gea is on 375k a week. I can't see anyone in Europe paying that, if I'm being completely honest. So they'll have to take a big fat L on his wages and have to pay some of him like we did with Alexis Sanchez or something. God knows what's going to happen with that. But again, De Gea is the least of our problems. I'm not trying to bring him in and say, he needs to be sold, he needs to do this, but... I'm trying to think in the mind of Ten Hag when he comes in. You know what I mean? Like, how he's going to want to play. So, yeah. And then you've got, you know, I don't even want to mention them. I just feel like they're not even, they're not even, they don't deserve a mention. But you've got the people where all these problems stem from. Um, the Glazers and the board have made poor decision after poor decision. Big contracts and wages given to players who don't deserve them. Awful recruitment where we spent a billion pounds and about 5 to 10% of them transfers have worked out. Um, they take out more dividends than any Premier League club in the league. They take advice from players within the club on certain decisions because they have mates in there. They have coaches still from all this time, so there's a weird mix in coaching staff. On An interim manager was brought in to save the season because we give a full-time job to an interim manager based on his legendary status as a player and the run of games he went on. That 12-game, you know, 20-game uh, undefeated streak, whatever it was. Um, we also, you know, in hindsight... When Oli came in, for me anyway, I, you know, as a fan, I was probably like, yeah, give it him. You know, he's just won 10 in a row or whatever. Everybody's playing like the chains are off him. This free-flowing football and stuff, blah, blah, blah. And in hindsight, I look back at it and I think, how naive and stupid was I to, to jump on the hype train and believe it and not look clearly. Um, and as a board, you know, people could say, well, fans were on it. They, they all loved it. But you've got to think with your head and not your heart in them decisions, and Oli just wasn't the right decision. They should have got, got out and got a proper, proper proven coach um, because it's just it didn't work at all. So, yeah, and, and you know, finishing up, our model as a club is based on commercial success and business and how people view us um, as a brand. We are not a footballing club who are connected with the fans and dominate Europe with our unique style of play. We are falling off from that category. And it's all about business and social media and who's the top on TikTok, who gets the most retweets on Twitter and all this kind of stuff. Because ultimately, they're probably thinking if we didn't have the business side of things and we weren't such a global reach, where would we be as a club? In their mind, they probably think that. But they don't realise if you had success on the pitch and you were successful in recruitment and stuff, that then things come two and two together. They tie together success and on the pitch means success as a club even like for business everywhere. Um, so that's always confused me. I don't, I don't understand how they've been run so like so bad for so long since Woodward has come in. It is eight to 10 years, whatever it's been, it's been atrocious, absolutely atrocious. Decision-making everywhere from top to bottom has been shit. And now we're at the bottom of the pile now where we're, we're almost hitting rock bottom. Some people might think that's playing a little violin because they're thinking, well, you're not in League One, you're not in League Two, you're not travelling to like a Newport County or something like that. You've still got players like Pogba, Ronaldo, it's amazing, blah, blah, blah. But you have to look at it just from what you're used to. This is, you know, it's Manchester United, treble winners, you know, the Premier League winners, multi-champions everywhere. Like, oh, it's, it's, it's depressing. It's so depressing. And when you're used to such a standard, you know, if you've been eating, I don't know, steak and chips every single day cooked to perfection and now you've got some dry ass crackers with fucking pickle on it or something and you're being force fed that you're going to be upset aren't you let's be honest so yeah don't try give me shit on that it's for all you pickle lovers out there but 
that's just how it feels at the minute. We're being force fed shit, and from from whether that's PR or performances or anything surrounding the whole club. So I'm gonna end this video with this message, and the message is: Good luck, Ten Hag. Good luck. I'll see you in the next one, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on all our socials. Just type in Real Reds Talk uh, anywhere and you should find us. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for tuning in.